1965 Shelby GT350 was an absolute hit on the streets. Now Shelby is gearing up for the 1966 production. Can they keep the momentum going? Step into the lounge and let's talk about the 1966 Shelby GT350. <laughs> Welcome back to the Gearhead Lounge. Thank you so much for the overwhelming support I've received for the 1965 Shelby GT350 history video. Before we get any farther, please subscribe and don't forget to ring that bell to make sure you're updated every time we upload a new video. So 1965 was a great year for the Shelby American Corporation as they built the 1965 Shelby GT350 and it was a raving success. Now they're getting ready for the 1966 production and this year's model production is going to be a lot bigger than 1965 and it's going to be wrought with its own set of challenges. So thanks for stopping by and step into the lounge and let's talk about what happened to the 1966 Shelby GT350. Shelby America must have been a madhouse in 1965. I mean, they were building Cobras, converting Mustangs into GT350s, and not to mention, they won the Manufacturer's Championship and SCCA B production with their fleet of GT350R models. The facility in Venice was the place to be, or not the place to be, depending on how you looked at things. On top of all that, once the production run of the 65 GT350s was finished, there was no time to rest as they had to get ready for the 1966 model run. The folks at Shelby took a step back to assess the 65 model year run and to see what, or if, anything needed to be improved. As great as the 65 model was, the GT350 had its share of criticism like, is there any other color than white? Where's my side mirror? Why is the battery in the trunk? Why is the spare tire in the back seat? Where is the back seat? It clunks. I hate that Falcon speedometer. The ride is too rough. It's too loud. We want more wheel options. You didn't build enough cars. Just to name a few. However, the team at Shelby was all over it. It was obvious that this 1965 GT350 was a bit hardcore for all but the purest of road racers. But they faced some obstacles. For starters, with everything that's going on, the facility in Venice was entirely too small and they needed to find a place to house everything under one roof. Another challenge was with Ford. They had to shut down the San Jose facility to retool for the 1966 model year run. And while there were some changes for the new model year, they still hadn't agreed on the final design of the new model. The former situation threatened to stall production of the new GT350 while the latter would have an effect on the final GT350 design for 1966. And if there was to be a smooth transition, Shelby needed to get started on manufacturing new items for the new model year as soon as possible. One of the biggest holdups was the discussion on the taillights. Ford had entertained the idea of changing them, which would have stalled production during the retooling process. Fortunately, Ford relented early on the taillights. Shelby had enough to contend with concerning the changes for the 66 model as well as the San Jose retooling process, and not to mention finding new place. Some of the changes to the 1966 Mustang included a new front grille. Gone was the honeycomb in favor of horizontal bars. The horse and corral were now floating, which didn't seem to be an issue until the horse and corral were removed, revealing the painted background only behind the horse, which required the tedious process of removing the paint in that section so the horizontal bars traveled uninterrupted across the front. On the inside, the optional 5-gauge cluster was now made standard. The new cluster included an oil pressure gauge, and to add insult to injury, along with the upgrade came a restyled dash pad that required a rethinking of the whole center-mounted tack and oil pressure gauge setup. The seat material was also changed to a textured insert, further differentiating the 1966 from the 65 model. Aside from a few other minor changes and options, the two model years shared most of their parts. At Shelby American, the engineering team was also working on their own changes to keep the momentum the 65 GT350 had begun. One of the most obvious items on the list was to expand the color choices for the new year. So, along with Wimbledon White, four new colors were added. The colors would be Raven Black, Ivy Green, 
candy apple red, and sapphire blue. All four of them were offered with optional Le Mans stripes painted in Chevrolet commercial white. Also for the exterior, the cove on the rear quarter panel behind the door was given a functional scoop that was ducted to direct air to the area of the rear brakes. Next, the vents on the roof were removed and the void was filled with a plexiglass window that gave the Shelby a unique look and slightly improved visibility. The rocket panel side stripe was changed from a painted on stripe with decal lettering to a full decal that was slightly narrower. The GT350 badge remained on the back, but like last year, not all cars received it. The stock Mustang gas cap was exchanged for a special Shelby cap with the Cobra emblem. For the interior, the spare tire was returned to the trunk, and the package tray was given ribs to give it the feel of a luggage rack. It was also made into an option, and not a very popular option, as only 100 cars left the production line with it. I mean, compared to the fold-down rear seat, standard in all Mustang 2 Plus 2s, the fold-down rear seat gave owners the option of carrying an additional two passengers or having a carpeted area for cargo. The trap door that opened into the trunk further improved the usefulness. The instrument panel and dash presented another challenge. In 1965, the factory gauges were lacking. With the slide rule speedometer bookended with the temp and fuel gauge, there just wasn't enough information given to the driver for a proper sports car. The new 5 gauge setup offered a sportier dial setup that included a speedometer that was complemented by a fuel level, oil pressure, amps, and coolant temperature gauges. With the need for an extra oil pressure gauge no longer present, and the dash pad being redesigned, the mounting of the tachometer needed to be rethought. The solution was a tachometer mounted on the top of the dash pad angled towards the driver. In 1965, the steering wheel was upgraded to a wood grain three-spoke wheel that could have easily been found in a Ferrari. For 1966 to save cost, Shelby opted to use the Mustang Deluxe simulated wood grain steering wheel with a Cobra center. It was just as nice and kept the horn where it should be on the steering wheel. The three inch lap belts were retained from last year. As far as the mechanicals go, things were pretty much the same. The Shelby I's 306 horsepower 289 remained the same as the previous year, along with the aluminum intake, poly carburetor, and tri wire headers. All made it to a close ratio four speed manual with the new for 1966 optional C4 automatic transmission. The biggest change in the engine compartment, other than the engine being painted blue, was the switch from the bare aluminum sand cast valve covers to the black die cast valve covers. The bracing for the grille was also changed from a single piece to bar stock. The front suspension was unchanged. However, out back, there were a few changes. The traction bars welded to the top of the axle, otherwise known as override traction bars, presented a problem in that one of the mounting bolts would strike the frame rail as the suspension traveled up and down. The solution was to grind the mounting bolt down to clear. The clunky Detroit locker was made an option, and the cars came standard with an open differential. While the side exiting exhaust was definitely an attention getter, it also gained the attention of governments in certain states that promptly ruled the loud exhaust illegal. As a result, the 1966 Shelby's came with the tri-y full-length headers made it to the Mustang factory exhaust system that exited out the rear with turned down pipes. No GT exhaust trumpets. The wheels were a story all in itself. In 1965, the GT350 utilized 15 inch wheels and you could either get the silver painted steel wheel or the deluxe wheel from Krager. Unfortunately, the 15 inch wheels were met with some complaints of tires rubbing the fenders. For 1966, Shelby decided to go with 14 inch wheels. Craigert offered to remake the deluxe wheel in 14 inch diameter, but that would have been an expensive move. Instead, Shelby American went with the Magnum 500 wheel. Painted in a color known as magnesium gray, these new wheels look good, especially since the wheels were painted black between the spokes and were offset by the chrome lug nuts and center cap. However, production was going to take time and building for the new year was just around the corner. For the time being, standard wheels were used while the 15-inch Kragers were used as the deluxe option until the new design arrived. Once in hand, the Magnum 500 wheels were made to be the standard wheel option. Speaking of new designs, Shelby engineer Phil Wilmington was also at work designing yet another wheel for the 66 Shelbys. 
Known as the 10 spoke wheel, this new design was made of aluminum with machined edges. The center cap was also made of aluminum and featured the Shelby CS logo. Once in production, they were to become the deluxe wheel option. So with the new GT350 design ready to go for 1966, there was still the matter of a new location, which was fixed by the acquisition of property on the south side of LAX. This new property featured two aircraft hangars on 12 acres that provided plenty of room for Shelby America's operations. There was also the matter of keeping production running while the San Jose plant closed down to retool for the 66 model year. The solution that Shelby had planned from the 65 model production was to order 252 1965 Wimbledon white fastback Mustangs and convert them to 1966 specs. These were known as near spec or carryover cars. Producing these cars would hopefully keep production running consistently until 1966 models arrived from Ford. These carryover cars were converted to the 66 mile year, but still retained the 65 upholstery, save for the updated gauges, which were actually 1965 deluxe gauge panels. Also, while backup lights became standard for 1966, these carryover cars lacked backup lights. The override traction bars continued with production with running modifications to minimize striking the frame. Unfortunately, the 1966 model run had its share of supply issues, which led to production delays. Among the delays were the front grills that were mentioned earlier. Precious time was used to clean the grill so that all the ribs would stretch from one side to the other. There was also a missing hardware needed to complete the installation of the rear quarter windows. The Magna 500 production was also slow, as well as the production for the parts of the ducting for the side scoops. The side mirrors were also slow to arrive. All Shelby could do was build cars as far as they could, then store them until they could be completed. Production began in the summer, and parts slowly began to dwindle in. By the fall, nearly all the carryover cars were ready to go, save for the installation of the side windows and the scoops. Meanwhile, back at Shelby headquarters, while they were continuing to complete production of the 1966 model years, Shelby had made a deal with the Hertz Rental Car Company. You see, Hertz had a special perk that allowed customers to join their sports car club, or FEE. Members were allowed to rent high-performance cars in certain vacation spots. Shelby agreed to supply them with 1,000 special belt GT350 Hertz models for rental purposes only. So, for $17 a day and 17 cents a mile, Sports Car Club members could travel to selected vacation spots around the country and drive pretty much the same car that won the STCA Production Championship. They're recognized mainly for their raven black with gold striped paint. However, there were other colors available in limited quantity. This change was, if anything, made to keep production running. The first 200 were raven black, and subsequent colors were candy apple red, Wimbledon white, sapphire blue, and ivy green but the majority of the cars were black. In addition to the different colors, some didn't come with Le Mans stripes, while some were simply delivered with regular GT350 lettering and not the GT350H on the sides. Other key features that made the Hertz special included chrome Magnum 500 wheels with special Hertz center caps and automatic transmission. Well, the truth is, the first 100 were four-speed cars, but Hertz received too many return rentals with burned clutches, so they decided that every car after that was to be an automatic. Another issue was with the brakes. Being delivered with a non-power assisted braking system with metallic line brake pads, the everyday average customer found the Shelby's extremely hard to stop with normal driving. The remedy was to change the pads to start the compound. However, the pedal was still hard to press, but no deal was struck on adding a power booster. While most cars were delivered with Magna 500 wheels, some were delivered with new aluminum 10-spoke wheels. The allure of driving such a vehicle was not without its ups and downs. Rumors of GT350Hs being rented and flogged on the racetrack, engine swap, and parts exchanged to fix other race cars ran rampant. Eventually, the production run of 1001 GT350 Hertz Mustangs was finally wrapped up with the promise from Hertz for 2000 1967 shovels, but the deal was never struck. Hertz would later purchase a small number of cars from Shelby for the 68 model year. Once the cars reached the end of their rental life, they were returned to Shelby, where they were distributed for sale on used car lots. Now, back to the GT350 production. 
Both GT350 and GT350 Hertz production was hampered by the lack of side scoops and quarter window pieces. But parts finally began to dwindle in, allowing Shelby to complete cars in batches. The overall GT350 production continued with running changes, for some to complete production, others to cut costs. For example, the override traction bars were phased out in exchange for traction bars manufactured by Traction Master. These bars required less welding to install, nor did they require cutting of the floor pan. The forward mount was a pad that welded near the leaf spring mount, and the trailing end bolted to the U-bolts that attached the rear end to the leaf springs. They were easier to install as well as being cheaper. Since these bars mounted under the axle, they were called underride traction bars. They were easily recognizable as they hung under the suspension. One of the trademark mods was to lower the upper control arm one inch, which worked for the 1965 Shelby. However, the 66 Shelby was built for a wider audience, many of whom weren't as hardcore as the 1965 fans were. So the decision was made to leave the front suspension alone, a move that would not only save time, but money as well, because time is money. Other changes included the fiberglass hoods being attached to steel hood frames that was later intended to lead to an all steel hood, but production was plagued with quality control issues and steel hoods were installed in just a few cars late in production. Speaking of the hood, the full factory forward hood latching mechanism was implemented during production also to cut costs. Shelby also made running changes to improve performance. Notably, it was found that the automatic equipped cars performed better with the Autolite 460 CFM carburetor instead of the 715 CFM Holly. Finally, Magnum 500s began coming in, which solved the standard wheel problem. But the Shelby 10 spoke didn't come until much later. So the Krager wheels remained the deluxe wheel option until the 10 spokes began to come in. However, once the 10 spokes began to trickle in, they were mounted to cars and sent out as quickly as they arrived. While the crew at Shelby American cranked out production, Carroll Shelby was always looking to be on the cutting edge. So back in 1965, Shelby was approached by Joe Granatelli about having a Paxton supercharged option for the Shelby. Finally, in 66, Shelby sent Granatelli a car for testing. The end result was a beast of a car that packed a super clean installation of a Paxton supercharger under the hood that boosted the horsepower from 306 to heights topping the 400 range. Thoughts of a GT350S model rang around the ranks of Shelby, but it was later decided to offer the blower as a $700 option, which is probably why only 10 GT350s besides the prototype left production with a factory installed supercharger. However, that didn't stop dealers from installing the kit on some of their existing inventory. Later, it became a part of the aftermarket catalog. Production ended with a special order. Looking forward to the 1967 model year, the crew at Shelby ordered four convertibles. Yes, convertibles. All 289 Hypo equipped, but two were ordered with four-speed manual transmissions and two with automatic transmissions. They were ordered this way as Shelby American was considering adding convertibles to the production line for the next model year. While drop top Shelby's didn't come until the 68 model year, it's safe to say the experiment was a success. In the end, a total of 1,377 GT350s were built for 1966 alongside 1,001 GT350 Hertz models. There was no official run of our model but plenty were converted to R model specs and campaigned in SCCA racing. It had been a tumultuous but very successful year. The Shelby crew worked hard to keep production going, yet built a competitive car as well. It evolved as a vehicle, as a GT car, and as a road car. The GT350 had built a reputation on the street and Shelby Mustangs were extremely popular. Shelby American had started a literal stampede and there was no stopping now. As production ended, the crew began to gear up for the 1967 model year production that would bring some major changes. Stay tuned. Thanks for stopping by and checking out our video on the 1966 Shelby GT350. This video was a lot of research and a lot of work and I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Before we go, subscribe and don't forget to ring that bell so you're updated every time we upload a new video. 
So now we're going to get started on the 1967 Shelby production. This is going to be a little different because we have a GT350 and a newly introduced GT500. So I'm going to start my research. We're going to start digging into it. And hopefully we'll have a video for you real soon. Thanks for stopping by. You guys take care. Get out of here.